Welcome back, folks. You've tuned into NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, again. Great to have you with us again. If you've been with us for a while or if this is your first time listening in, we do hope you'll make a habit of it. For today's episode, we're going to talk a bit about commercial property again. And this time, to be more specific, we're going to touch on Japan's retail market. So shopping is huge in Japan, as it is in most modern countries. According to Japan's government external trade agency, JETRO, Japan's retail market is actually the world's second largest, with retail sales currently exceeding 150 trillion yen. That's 1.3 trillion US dollars. This obviously hasn't escaped the notice of all major global brands. And the fact is that Japan is also very much um, an authentic, uh, even luxury-oriented consumer market. So as opposed to other Asian markets, which often look for the cheaper options for copies of existing luxury products, fakes and so forth, Japan actually likes the real thing. So obsessed with consumerism, really no other way to put it. And big brands, marketers, etc. are all very aware of that. Any global brand which respects itself uh, will have a very large footprint in the retail sector here with shops in all major cities and a very large percentage of the smaller tier two and tier three, three cities as well. So the result of this is that Japan is really shopper's paradise, wherever in the country you might be, not just for the locals, but for tourists as well. 35% of Asian tourists who are traveling to Japan cite their main reason for travel as shopping, believe it or not. So what kind of shopping are these, all, um, are these tourists and locals all into? Again, keeping in mind the luxury brand's mindset, the main sector in the country's retail market are high-end specialty stores, apparel and lifestyle environmental products, which are sold again all over the country. And if you'll recall from our annual summary at the start of the year, they're actually facing some massive competition and downturn due to the rise of internet shopping. Regardless though, as anyone who's walked around any busy Japanese city probably knows well, shopping malls, supermarkets, department stores, street shops are full pretty much at all hours of the day and sometimes well into the night too. This is in spite of the fact that until 2012, the country has actually been in deflationary and recessional mode for more than 20 years. But again, you wouldn't know it looking at the Japanese. They simply love shopping. So how do we as foreign or sometimes even resident foreign investors capitalize on this? Well, the first thing to note here is that, again, due to the rise of internet shopping, which has been pushing hard against traditional brick and mortar margins, and also due to the country's general economic climate these days, prices and rents for retail commercial properties have actually been pretty stagnant since 2016. Prime location rentals in Tokyo have even been trending down. New shopping centers, new shopping malls are sti still being built, though, which probably means that prices will continue to remain stagnant or even trend down. Japanese consumer confidence, on the other hand, and general retail sale volumes um, are on the rise from both tourists and locals, probably a lot of it due to the increasing number of tourism here um, heading towards the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. So these lower purchase prices aren't necessarily a bad thing for the sector as a whole. Although if rents keep dropping in Tokyo and other main spots, you may want to look to other locations if you want to own a commercial retail property that makes a reasonable profit. So going for prime shopping locations such as Ginza or Motesando in Tokyo doesn't actually guarantee that you'll be able to raise your rents going forward. So it may be a bit wiser to look at other locations as well. As for what type of assets to buy. Well, the instinct is usually to go for a shopping center or department store, and these can definitely be an attractive investment. But there are two main issues here that you need to consider. Firstly, they're quite expensive, obviously. And secondly, you need a local management team. This isn't something that you can do remotely unless you've got a very good, very experienced local partner in place, somebody who's been profitably running these types of operations for quite some time. So they'll need to take care of infrastructure concerns, building management considerations, ongoing maintenance requests from tenants, 
emergency issues from shoppers and tenants. And these things will keep popping up on a daily basis. The larger the shopping center, the more time consuming this will be. Since you are, for all practical purposes, running a business, which is quite different to your typical buy and hold property investment scenario of the sort that we've been covering here on the podcast so far. If you're more of a hands-off investor, as most investors who are not residents of the country are, you may want to consider buying into street-level shops instead of that. So not in department stores, not the entire shopping center itself, but street-level shops. That puts you in a straight-out, simple rental income scenario. No business management headaches to worry about or deal with, aside from the normal. So tenant moves in, tenant moves out, a bit of maintenance, renovation concerns. You will have more of these concerns uh, if you compare it with offices or residential properties, because obviously you've got more food traffic, but way less than you'll have if you're actually running a shopping center. So it's not going to eat into your time resources as heavily as that. Another advantage in investing in singular street level shops is that it allows you to diversify your holdings more since you can spread your budget over several neighborhoods, cities, socioeconomic and geographical profiles. And diversity is always a good thing, regardless of which sector or sectors you're operating in. One last strategy that you may want to pursue, and we've discussed this here in the past as well, is that Again, taking internet shopping into account, uh, and that's definitely booming. It's not something that's going to stop being a thing. It will keep growing. It will keep biting into the retail pie more and more. It may also be a good idea to capitalize on the retail market by catering to those online shop operators. So investments in assets like data center facilities, storage and warehouse facilities, Um, Shipping houses, especially in suburbs of large cities, will be a great position to be in. You may have to get a little bit creative with these since they're in very high demand. So, for example, buying old and rundown small residential properties on the outskirts of big cities and paying to tear them down, removing the leftovers, and then either rebuilding or waiting for the right kind of tenant to build to order may give you a good plot of land and a desirable spot. And that will be a big bonus for you, especially as the same day delivery trend becomes more popular. So shoppers these days expect to receive their order pretty much instantly. And so people running these online operations will be needing to rent these type of facilities as close to the city as they can get. So again, a great position to be in if you can cater to that. Okay, folks, that's probably it from us today. Hope you've enjoyed this episode and maybe gotten some ideas on how to structure the retail portion of your portfolio, if that's something you've been looking into at all. As always, if you've enjoyed what you've heard from us so far, please feel free to comment on this episode or the podcast in general. And of course, share it with anyone who might find it interesting. We'd also love it if you could rate us either on the iTunes store, the Google Play store, or wherever you may have found us on, if it allows ratings. We're looking forward to having you with us next time. And until then, as always, We wish you happy investing.